I'm reading a fascinating book at the moment called The War of the Three Gods that deals with the final byzantine sassanid War of 602 to 628 AD, as well as the rise of Islam. The three gods, of course, refer to Jesus Christ, Ahura Mazda, and Allah, and reflect the aspect of the, the conflict that the three different sides each followed a different religion and represented very different systems and very different ways of looking at the world. While I will do a more in-depth video specifically on the rise of Islam, as it's a fascinating topic, I kind of wanted to focus a bit about on the final byzantine sassanid War, because there's a very interesting parallel that can be drawn between Khusro II, the Shah of the Sassanid Empire, and Heraclius, the Emperor of the Byzantine Empire. As both men are incredibly tragic figures, both of them ruled their empires at the height of their power, when they had conquered the most territory, when there was no real rival to each other other than each other, there wasn't any other real big state powers that could challenge them. In a total war, I guess you had the Chinese Empire, but obviously they weren't in direct conflict, and there was probably some large Indian states too, but once again, they weren't in direct conflict. It looked like the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean was divided up between these two superpowers, and everyone else was just a bunch of barbarians, be they Turks or Arabs or Avars or Slavs. They were just kind of little people to be swept aside while the big boys hammered on one another. Both Heraclius and Khusro won stunning military victories, arguably the most impressive military victories in the history of their respective empires, during the exact same war, which is also kind of fascinating, and both of whom, if they had stopped or died at a specific point in time, almost certainly would have been remembered as the greatest leader in their country's history. Uh, Heraclius would probably be remembered as the greatest Byzantine emperor since Constantine, and maybe the greatest Byzantine emperor of all time, if he had have died right after the Sassanid Persian War. Likewise, if Khusro had have imposed strict terms on the Byzantines at the height of his war, then he might be remembered as the greatest Persian Empire since Cyrus the Great, and be a national hero to this day. Instead, both men's names now are um, associated with failure, disaster, the complete and total collapse of their empires. While the Byzantine Empire would limp along for another 700 or 800 years or so, it would never come close to the peak that it was under Heraclius and his immediate predecessors. Likewise, in the case of Iran, I don't think it was until the 17th or 18th century with the Safavids that you had a native Persian dynasty ruling the Iranian plateau once again. And while a lot of people do honor Heraclius as being the man who saved Eastern Christendom from the Persian Empire, at the same time there'll always be this huge black mark on him that he's the man who lost the Middle East, who lost Egypt, who lost Africa, who ended any hope that the Eastern Roman Empire might have been able to restore itself to Rome's former glory. Before we get into the war a bit more, I always think there's an interesting parallel between Heraclius and of Vladimir Lenin. Maybe this is a kind of a strange comparison to make, but Heraclius lived too long. If he had of, like I said, died right after his victory, he would have been remembered as the greatest Byzantine emperor. Likewise, Lenin got lucky in that he died when he did. I feel if Lenin had have been able to actually rule Russia uh, far beyond the civil war for even another five or ten years, he would have completely destroyed Russia, and all the stuff that was later blamed on Stalin, he would have been blamed for, and things might have gone even worse. But because he died shortly after the Civil War, and he wasn't really able to impose his vision on the country, he's remembered very fondly. So it's kind of an interesting case of living too long, unluckily, and dying too soon, but being lucky about it. That being said, let's get into the context of the, the war from a historical perspective. I'm using EU4, the extended timeline mod, to show the progress of this, because it's the easiest way to show the various maps and how territory changed over time. So as many of you are likely aware, when the Roman Empire collapsed, it split into two halves. The Western Roman Empire, which quickly was broken up by a variety of barbarian successor kingdoms, and the Eastern Roman Empire, 
which is anachronistically known as Byzantium because Constantinople, its capital, was a converted city that was known as Byzantium. It's kind of a way to differentiate the two because it can get kind of confusing when you talk about the Roman Empire going into the 14th and 15th century. It's also to reflect the fact that Greek culture and the Greek language became the dominant force in the Byzantine Empire and it was no longer a Latin state as it had been under the previous emperors. From my understanding, the Byzantines always called it the Roman Empire, and other people always called it the Roman Empire. Uh, in fact, one of the successor states was called the Sultanate of Rum or the Sultanate of Rome. We just use the term Byzantine so people have the general period that we're referring to, and so we know we're talking about Greeks rather than Latins. But when the Roman Empire collapsed and the East survived, it should be noted that by this point in time, the East was a lot wealthier than the West. From my understanding, the two wealthiest provinces in the Roman Empire were Egypt and Syria, both which were securely under the control of the Byzantines. Also, in the complete political chaos in the West, it was still expected at some point that at least some of the territory would be resubjugated. And this brings us to Justinian the Great, who probably deserves his own video. But he was, interestingly enough, the last emperor of uh, Byzantium that spoke Latin as his native language. And he was a man of immense talents, and it was his desire to completely rebuild the Roman Empire and retake all the land that had been lost in the West. And to his credit, he actually had a pretty good go of it. So let's jump ahead a little bit. Under him, they were able to retake Africa, which actually is quite useful because it was a major grain production area. Uh, they were able to retake most of Italy, although that's kind of a mess. We can talk about that later. They grabbed a bunch of parts of Spain. Most of the coast of the Mediterranean had been regained by Justinian, and Byzantium was a superpower once again, encompassing quite a bit of the former Roman Empire, at least the, the majority of the very the most productive and populous provinces. Justinian also embarked on legal reforms, construction projects, that kind of thing. But the plague of Justinian broke out and devastated the empire's population. And so when we get to Heraclius, it's a bit of a paper tiger. On one hand, it is at its greatest territorial extent, but it's also very depopulated and facing financial disaster. Because Justinian's successors were not Justinian and didn't have his almost divine level of natural talent, as well as the decreased population. Looking at the Sassanids, the Sassanids had succeeded the Parthians as being the major antagonists from the Romans uh, of the Roman Empire, and had built a much stronger state than the Parthians previously had, adopting strict Zoroastrianism as being the legitimizing force of their regime. And once again, we could talk about Zoroastrianism a bit more previously. Now, we had had a series of wars between the two empires, uh, the Sassanids and the Byzantines, primarily over uh, the Mesopotamia and uh, Armenia, with Armenia going back and forth from being a Roman client king and being a Sassanid client kingdom. From my understanding, the Armenians were more culturally and linguistically close to the Persians but they were Christians, so it was a very natural battleground between the two empires as to who would be able to control it. And you basically had a, a bunch of different wars between the two of them that more or less always ended in either minor territorial adjustments or status quo antebellum. Well, Byzantium, and sorry if this is kind of cringy, if you look here, Byzantium has about 1600 development. And the Sassanids have about 600 development, which is not really historically inaccurate. Uh, the Eastern Roman Empire had a much larger population and economic base, but they had to defend like all of these borders. They had to fight the Visigoths, they had to fight in Italy, they had to fight in the, um, the Balkans, and they were unable to really put their back into it. Persia is also very difficult to occupy because a lot of it is at this point was still nomadic or it was across the mountains or something, and you had to manage really long supply chains. So more or less all of the uh, gains were ephemeral. Every couple decades, you'd get a Persian shah who'd say, I'm going to restore the Akhmed Empire to its full, full glory. I'm the king of kings. 
uh, I am the true successor to Rome. Or you'd get a Byzantine emperor who'd be like, we have to save the Christians in Armenia, and he'd march east. And it was mostly just the two of them showing off. But things would change, though, with the byzantine sassanid War of 602. Emperor Maurice had um, formed a tight alliance with, the, with Khusro, the emperor of the Sassanid Empire, but unfortunately Justin was overthrown in a military coup. Uh, the various Byzantine emperors were trying to cut expenditure because the state was bankrupt by lowering military salaries, and when you don't pay soldiers, the obvious tends to happen. Um, and they were completely overthrown and replaced by a usurper named Focus, which caused Khusro to start his invasion. Now, the Roman Empire had just gone through a civil war. They were facing, I think, a war with the Avars. They were facing wars on a bunch of different fronts. A lot of people didn't accept Focus as being their leader. The Lombards were resurgent in Italy. And... Kusro found very little resistance. He was able to just kind of go through the Byzantine lines like a brick. If we're just going to put this up. He just like blew through them like a brick uh, through a window and completely and utterly devastated the Byzantines in the east. I mean, if you look at the sheer amount of territory he conquered in a relatively short amount of time, he managed to occupy all of Syria, all of Egypt, and much of Anatolia. Now, around this point in time, there was yet another civil war in the Byzantine Empire in which Heraclius, who had been one of the leaders in the province of Africa, keep in mind Africa, it refers to Tunisia, uh, was one of the leaders of Africa, had launched his own military coup and seized control of the capital and had become the next emperor. Now, at this point in time, Heraclius, as with Phocas before him, realized that the Byzantines were on life support. They had lost a lot of their population and tax base. The Avars were invading them yet again. They were having to deal with the Slavs. Um, Khusro seemed unstoppable. And basically Heraclius just begged for surrender terms. Uh, Khusro, though, and this is kind of where the tragedy begins, because he had accomplished what no Persian emperor had since probably Sharpur, he had brought the Roman Empire to its knees. He had defeated a much larger state, that much economically and demographically larger state than himself, and just kind of completely curb stomped them. And at this point in time, he could more or less dictate whatever terms he wanted. He could probably demand all of Armenia, uh, maybe even Syria, up into including the Mediterranean coast. Uh, Persia might have become a Mediterranean power once again. I think at this point in time, Heraclius was willing to just give away pretty much everything, as well as, of course, a mountain of gold. And had Khusro had just realized, look, this isn't sustainable in the long term, I don't have the men to occupy this much territory, even if I did, there's just so many Christians and non-Persians in this land, it's just not going to work out. He, he was kind of a LARPer, though, and he said, no, I'm going to restore the Achmed Empire to its traditional borders, including Greece. And more or less, his demands were everything. I'm going to become the successor to the Roman Empire, and I'm going to take absolutely everything. So at this point, Heraclius was literally unable to surrender, and Khusro decided it would be a good idea to besiege Constantinople. Now, besieging Constantinople is kind of like the invading Russia of Middle Eastern empires. Up until you get fairly modern cannons, it's basically impossible because you have uh, th triple thick walls and Constantinople is also very easy to supply from the sea. So you have to besiege it on both sides of the Bosphorus because it straddles the two continents as well as doing a naval blockade. And that's incredibly logistically difficult. Uh, fortunately, the Persians had allies in the Avars who came down and besieged Constantinople from the north. However, the Avars didn't really know what they were doing, and they got beaten back and just kind of left. Uh, the Byzantines were initially going to pay them to leave, but they said the surrender terms are you give us Constantinople and you remove all the Greeks from it. And the Byzantines just told them no. And then they were defeated in subsequent um, 
assaults. So the Avars were defeated. I think Heraclius won a couple major wars and settled terms in the Balkans. And then he just spent a year or two building up an army for a massive counteroffensive. And eventually what wound up happening is in a couple short years, he managed to retake all the territory or most of the territory that was lost and invade Persia proper. And he went on a campaign of just kind of devastation among the western parts of the Persian Empire. And Khusro was overthrown. And then his successor was overthrown by one of the major generals of the Sassanid Persian War. And then he was overthrown and the Sassanid Empire descended into a four-year-long anarchy which further depleted the empire's resources and left it a complete sitting duck for when the Rashidun Caliphate showed up. So you can kind of see what I mean by the tragedy of Khusro. He could have been the greatest uh, Shah of the Sassanids. He might have even been able to beat the Arabs if he had a pulled out of the war before it turned into a total disaster and exhausted his empire. Uh, one apocryphal uh, story about his death is that uh, they executed him by locking him in a room full of gold and jewels, but with no water or food, in reference to how greedy he was and how callous he had been with regards to human life. And so, like I said, though, Heraclius had managed to pull it off. He had saved the Roman Empire from complete and total disaster. He had managed to beat back the Persians. Uh, an important detail is when the Persians had taken Jerusalem, they had taken the true cross away. Uh, Heraclius got it back as part of the peace agreement. He got the Persians to pay him a bunch of money. I mean, things sucked, but he was in a position where he could recover. Unfortunately, there was an Arab prophet named Muhammad who was a very competent leader, and we'll do a video on that. But if we just look at this, so this is uh, the Rashidun Caliphate in 630. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the... One second, let's just go back. Okay, so 628, the last year of the byzantine sassanid War, we have the Rashidun Caliphate, and we're going to jump ahead a couple of years. Within a couple of years, Muhammad had managed to unify the entirety of the Arab Peninsula, as well as um, uh, even starting to go into Mesopotamia. Uh, he was, of course, succeeded by his father-in-law, Abu Bakr, who then took the war to the Sassanids. And the Sassanids basically just went down like a... Once again, it was a brick through a glass window. Um, the, the Arabs just completely and totally destroyed them, largely due to Ibn Walid, who we can talk about at another day, who is probably the second best general in history. I maintain that Nader Shah is the best, but Ibn Walid is probably the second. So he just des they just destroyed the Sassanids, and then they succeeded in overrunning uh, like the entirety of the Byzantine Middle East in like a decade or two. I mean, if we look at all the territory that's been lost, let's see, where when did Heraclius die? Yeah, so by the time Heraclius died, uh, he had seen the loss of Egypt, Armenia, Syria, uh, Judea, basically the entirety of the Byzantines, Middle Eastern provinces had disappeared. And in the years following his death, they would, the Byzantines would also lose uh, the important provinces of Africa, Cyprus. Uh, it just turned into a complete and total disaster. So that's kind of what I mean by the tragedy of Heraclius is that he lived too long. If he had died afterwards, he would always be remembered as the man who had led the Byzantines to their greatest glory, who had saved the empire in its darkest hour. He would have been the new Arulian. But unfortunately, he lived a couple of years b b beyond the war and saw the Byzantine Empire lose most of its territory, or probably about half. I'd imagine most of the empire's population was probably in Syria and Egypt. So it lost its wealthiest provinces as well as its main population centers, and it would just gradually get eaten away by the Arabs for the next couple centuries before, obviously, we start to get into the Camino Re uh, Restoration. And the Arabs would once again attempt to besiege Constantinople and fail utterly, but that's a topic for another day. 
So that's the byzantine sassanid War of 602 to 628, as well as the twin tragedies of Heraclius and Khusro II. I think it's a pretty interesting topic. Like I said, when I finish the book, I'll do a separate video about the rise of Islam and kind of what happened with that and what were the conditions that led to it. Because it is a fascinating combination of historical accidents of getting lucky, as well as the skill and morale of the various parties involved. So I hope you enjoyed the video and you found it 